Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Field, and I'm the president of KCC's History and Philosophy Club. Uh, we're a new student organization here on campus, and uh, we're so thrilled that so many of classmates, faculty, staff, and community members are here joining us. Before beginning with the program, I'd like to recognize and thank a number of people and organizations who made this gathering possible. First of all, thank you for coming out and being here. Your presence and interest in engaging topics such as today's talk serves as a source of motivation for us to continue hosting such events and creating collaborative partnerships with the community going forward. A special thanks to KCC Student Activities Council for providing with food, which smells great. Thanks to Brendan Shimokawa, Ken Tanigawa, and Amy Watase for arranging the venue, the tables and chairs, and Amy equipment. Thanks to the students and members of the KCC History and Philosophy Club for setting up. Thanks to our Vice President, JC Shimabakuro, for making these beautiful lays. Thanks to Raymond Catania, Kip Goodwin, and all the fine people at the Kauai Alliance for Peace and Social Justice for collaborating, introducing us to tonight's featured speaker, and organizing this program. Thank you to all the people at the Garden Island for your articles and free publicity about this presentation. Thanks to Felicia and Jimmy at KKCR for getting the word out on your radio shows. Thanks to Robert Zelkowski of Bamboo Moon Productions for videotaping this event. And thanks to John Lattman and Professor Umbrello for all the hard work you put into preparing your presentations and for taking time out of your day to share your knowledge on the colonization and militarization of the Korean Peninsula. You know, it's, oops. <laughs> uh, you know, it's almost surreal thinking about the topic of this uh, presentation tonight. In my life, I've never really experienced anything quite like this. 9-11 was before my time. We've had wars, school shootings, natural disasters, all that. There have been wars on terrorism, drugs, crime. All of those are dangers that I've had to face, protect myself from, but I could. I could take precautions. And the threat of the nuclear attack is much more frightening to me because I've never been in a situation where the threat has been so absolute and there isn't anything we can do to stop it. I've never had to worry about this entire island literally being destroyed or at least changed. When the nuclear siren was tested the other day, it felt like we should be afraid. This isn't just a fire alarm, a hurricane siren, or some natural event that could cause destruction. This is us preparing for something completely intentional and very real. There's something frightening about the unknown, and there's something even more frightening about a place or event we come to know only through the media that seems to sensationalize every aspect of the truth. With so many variables, what seems like a divided country and an unpredictable government, Korea seems even more threatening. With that in mind, I hope Mark and John can shed some light on the past and present situations in Korea and really put what's happening into context for us. I would now like to introduce Mr. Raymond Catania of the Kauai Alliance for Peace and Social Justice for opening remarks. Thank you. Well, we're doing, we're doing a nice crowd over here. And um, the Kauai Alliance for Peace and Social Justice is an activist organization concerned about creating peace in this world and fighting for the rights of those people that are oppressed and are on the bottom. And um, we feel that it's important to, uh, to speak truth to power. Now, I used to be a college student before at one time, many years ago, and um, people told us we couldn't do anything if we voice our opinions. But to me, it's a bunch of bogus because we stopped the war in Vietnam, okay? We not only stopped the war in Vietnam, we stopped the draft, you know. And we set the foundation in this country for the peace movement and for the movement for social justice for Hawaiians, for blacks, for working people and other minorities. I've dedicated my whole life to the cause for peace and social justice. And I think we can do something about it. And in particular, students play a key role. The intelligentsia plays a key role in changing what's going on in society. 
we can change the viewpoints in this country to one that's directed towards peace and negotiation and deliberation and working things out with people that we don't necessarily agree with. It's really important that we try to avoid, avoid war. It's not a good thing. People mock it. Okay, I've had cousins and friends that came home with PTSD and some of them have even died. Yeah, I for myself was a resistor against the war in Vietnam. Okay, and I'm proud to say that. You know, and a lot of my friends were like that too. And I think we can really do it. And one of the um, things that happened in 1974 to the 37th president of the United States, Richard Nixon, we forced him out. We forced him out, the people forced him out, because what he had done was break into the DNC at that time and try to block what was going on in the Democratic Party. And that was illegal and that was wrong. We cannot do that kind of stuff. You know, we have to make sure that we have democracy that works in America, works in Hawaii, and everywhere else. And so what happened? There was so much pressure that this guy was forced to resign. The hearing starting in July, you know, and then by August, the bugger had to go. He would quit. And we can put pressure on our elected officials if they're helping on creating war. Anyway, brothers and sisters, the next one coming up is, okay, that's Mr. Mark Umbrello. Uh, the teacher at this school, and we're so glad to have him involved. Thank you. Remind me to um, do the movie, right? Just so I don't forget, right after I go. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, so great to see so many of you, and I just want to reiterate all the thank yous and what a great speech uh, Catherine uh, was able to put together. I, she didn't show it to me or anything. And Nice job. Uh, I just want to start off with a few words about uh, something that happened to me uh, where I used to live uh, about, what is it? I can't keep track of time anymore. It's 2017, about four years ago, 2013, April. Um, and at that time, uh, there was a similar threat uh, going on, and it was really directed at uh, the territory of Guam. And at that time, I was uh, a professor there, and I was teaching, it just so happened, I was actually teaching modern Korean history uh, that semester. And so this was the first time uh, people in Guam had ever really uh, had anything like that before. And so their the reactions and concern prompted the president uh, to ask me to put together a panel uh, to help the community better understand the context by which these threats were being made. And so I was able to get some experts together, uh, local, uh, including a colleague of mine who uh, was a good friend, and she was from Korea. And we were able to put people more at ease uh, with our presentations and panel discussion. Uh, sounds pretty familiar, right? Uh, the answer is kind of yes and kind of no. Uh, yes, in the sense that our presentations and the one today, you know, the ones that we, we gave before, you know, uh, all aim to provide context so that we can better understand our present situation with regard to the North Korean crisis and how it affects our community. So those, that was, that, that's, that's all the same there. But no, in the sense that I believe the conditions uh, on the U.S. side of the equation have radically changed under the Trump administration and run counter to well-established diplomatic policies employed by the United States since the 1990s. And what does that mean? Well, I'm afraid I can't confidently uh, come out and tell you that everything uh, is great and there really isn't anything to worry about because that's essentially the message that uh, we gave in uh, 2013, especially given you know, we spent uh, our time trying to provide a sort of Korean-focused perspective and people in Korea just accept this reality of a uh, belligerent, uh, and very dangerous neighbor, but uh, they both sort of uh, understand that um, having any kind of military conflict is not in either of their best interests. Uh, but not, and, and so uh, we were able to, you know, make people feel at ease, uh, you know, those people who attended the event back in 2013. Um, 
What I can say is that that message applies with regard to trying to understand where people in North Korea are coming from, and that was the other sort of um, message that we were trying to do. Uh, rather than simply dismissing the leadership and the people of North Korea as crazy, you know, this idea of othering. Uh, so what I'd like to do is provide a broad overview of modern Korean history from the 19th century through the present day with a focus on the Japanese colonial period. Okay. Now, uh, beginning with this slideshow, can you uh, go to the next slide? There's a song in North Korea, and it's called Nothing to Envy. Uh, and I'd just like to show you the, uh, the lyrics to it. Maybe, I don't know if you can read it, but we'll, maybe I should read it right now. It says, Our Father, we have nothing to envy in this world. Our house is within the embrace of the Workers' Party. We are all brothers and sisters, even if a sea of fire comes toward us. Sweet children, do not be afraid. Our Father is here. We have nothing to envy in this world. Okay, that's pretty powerful, right? Maybe uh, it's even more powerful considering this is something that children, you know, uh, are very well aware of. Uh, so what I'd like to do first is just bring, uh, you know, uh, go through this overview and then come back to the song and see if uh, it makes even more sense, okay? So the first slide, this slide here is a, a slide of the Korean Peninsula. And uh, prior to the 20th century, this is probably late 19th century, and at the time we see a very unified politically, economically, and cultural Korea. Okay, and that's sort of the takeaway, is that for so much of uh, you know, history, Korea is a unified place. Uh, and so uh, they held a close relationship with China that reflected Confucian principles that stressed relationships of obligation and res respect between superiors and subordinates. China and Korea maintained sort of this big brother, little brother-like relationship, very Confucian. And what we see is one dynasty, right, ruling from the late 14th uh, to the early 20th centuries, okay? So, a lot of continuity. Society was highly stratified uh, and controlled by an elite class that consisted of Confucian scholars and landowners uh, who worked with and sometimes against the monarchy to maintain power. And because of this emphasis on Confucianism, everybody knew their place and what they could expect from life. And as you might guess, the great majority of people were peasants. Uh, something you may not be aware of uh, was slavery also existed all the way up into the late 19th century. The Chosun government uh, takes an isolationist stance towards advancing gestures of foreign influence from Western powers. It is here that we see the phrase hermit kingdom getting coined, right? A lot of times we see this term applied to North Korea, but it has much longer roots uh, beginning in this period of sort of 19th century um, Euro-American uh, imperialism um, playing out. The Chosun government, uh, oh, I'm sorry, can we go back one more? Uh, as for what's going on in the region, China under the Qing dynasty is barely holding on. While Japan is busy adopting Western imperialist playbook and running, it with it, uh, and running with it at full speed. Subsequently, Korea gets caught in the crossfire. And this is going to be the pattern. You know, this is what we're going to see time and time and time again. Korea in the middle of all of this. Uh, so, next slide. China, Japan, and the Western powers all exert pressure on the Chosun government to open up or recognize their influences over Korean affairs. Japan becomes the first nation to impose unequal treaties. This is a pretty standard tool of imperialism. Uh, and they do that in 1876 with the Kongwa Treaty. And once that starts, like all the other countries, we see it happen in China, uh, all the other nations follow. And they get all those nice little goodies, right? Like extraterritoriality and you know, unfair, unfair uh, tax breaks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, nice. So everyone seems to want a piece of Korea. Japan and China particularly are at odds over maintaining influence in the peninsula. As a result, reform measures are taken by the Chosun government. And this is important to, to, to consider. However, these policies are widely unpopular among the elite, the elite, right? 
this uh, scholar gentry elite class, the young bond. They are not liking it. Uh, in addition, the government's weakening position to imperialist nations results in strong anti-foreign movements and sentiments. Uh, the anti-foreign and anti-landowner slash elite class religious rising, uprising uh, causes great upheaval. The big one is known as the, uh, the Tongak Rebellion. And so what happens is uh, Japan uses this as a pretext to go to war with China. And this is the first Sino-Japanese War from 1895 to 1896. Uh, the Korean Queen, uh, Queen Min, she sees Russia as a potential ally that can act as a buffer to Japanese influence. And so what happens is the leader of the Japanese legation uh, orders the assassination of the Queen. And as you can imagine, a rise uh, in anti-Japanese sentiment intensifies. She is uh, assassinated, and it's brutal. All the while, uh, certain politically savvy and educated elites want to get rid of the monarchy and reform along the lines of Japan. They are anti-establishment and pro-Japanese. So already we see this incredibly diverse range of stakeholders uh, of all political and economic stripes engaging one another. Ultimately, Japan and Russia go to war, and much of the fighting happens on Korean soil, another instance of Korea being in the middle. Finally, a peace settlement favorable to Japan is brokered by the US uh, president, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. So what's the deal? You know, uh, what is this deal that's brokered? Well, the US is allowed to maintain control over the Philippines, and Japan becomes protectorate of the Korean Peninsula, marking the beginning of the Japanese colonial period. So from 1905 to 1919, uh, and this is the first stage of the Japanese uh, colonial project there, Japan takes a very hard line approach uh, to rule. They have a heavy police presence, uh, they impose very harsh laws, there are tight restrictions against nationalist movements, etc. It's a tough time. Uh, and to exploit natural resources, infrastructure building and modernization occurs with heavy industry, and this is sort of the takeaway, in the north. Uh, meanwhile, Japan establishes a working relationship with the wealthy landover, landowner class, right? This uh, Confucian Yangban uh, group. So, a seminal moment in modern Korean history happens on Ma March 1st, 1919, and it's known as the March 1st Movement. On this day, intellectuals and nationalist leaders, many of them educated in Japan, lead peaceful protests demanding Korean independence. What do you think happens? Well, Japan responds with a harsh military crackdown. Really harsh. Although the international community becomes upset uh, by the severe response, the powerful nations, almost all of whom are heavily invested in their own uh, colonial agendas, essentially turn a blind eye to the plight of the Korean people. Next slide. Uh, but there's a substantial shift in how Japan conducts colonialism in the peninsula by adopting a softer approach after the March 1st movement. Uh, this period where this new direction is implemented is known as the cultural government period. And this period lasts from 1919 uh, to 1931. Uh, Japanese authorities, what they do is they start to loosen restrictions against the spreading of ideas, uh, there's more mobility, uh, there's more economic opportunity, and there's uh, more opportunities for people to assemble. Yet, and this is the whole thing about colonialism, right, and modern colonialism, right, Japan increases its police presence and adopts more sophisticated methods to control populations. Um, so what's going on? Well, many intellectuals are debating what visions of nationalism and ideas should be adopted. Communism? Anarchism? Liberal, liberal democracy? Cultural natural, uh, nationalism? It's all in the mix. All these ideas are all going around. And like I said, ironically, many of the, these ideas are coming from... Anybody? Japan. Japan. It's all coming from Japan. 
who are engaged in developing these visions? Well, there are some Korean nationalists living overseas and establishing provisional governments, uh, like uh, Syngman Rhee. And anybody know? He is the first president, he becomes the first president of South Korea, ultimately. Uh, meanwhile, other nationalists are fighting, fighting a guerrilla war against the Japanese in Manchuria, such as, anybody know? Kim Il-sung. And who's Kim Il-sung? the first leader of North Korea, right? So we have a couple of big questions to ponder. What visions of Korean nationals, nationalism to take, right? That's the big one. And the other one, you know, more on sort of a day-to-day -day how to experience life is how does one get by under colonial rule? How do you do it? Uh, so when thinking about colonialism, it's critical to understand that some people will benefit, some will suffer, and some will both benefit and suffer, right? It's extremely messy. Issues of collaboration will then get thrown into the mix because of these realities. Of course, anti-Japanese sentiment will be directed at Koreans who are seen as collaborating with the colonizer. And what happens is some Korean businessmen uh, gain from investments and business opportunities during this time. So fast forward, you know, we're moving past 31, we get to this last phase of uh, the colonial period. And so as Japan heads to war, uh, colonial policies get harsh again. So we see a return uh, to a harsh approach. This time Japan emphasizes assimilation which includes making Korean people speak only Japanese, take Japanese names, uh, worship in Shinto shrines, etc., etc. They also make Korean people do hard labor, uh, join the Japanese military, and many women are forced into sexual slavery. You know, this issue of comfort women. I don't like that term, I, I prefer sexual slavery. The result is, of course, anti-Japanese sentiment, right, rising again. Um, so, visions of nationalism, do they go away? Of course not, right? We're still working this out, right? It's still being, and it's sort of the never-ending issue, right? So, uh, they are being influenced by the Japanese colonial experience, of course, and associated with anti-Japanese sentiments. Uh, Anti-establishment sent sentiment is also strong. Uh, because the old elite are seen as collaborators. So we have various competing visions of how to go forward now that the Korean Peninsula is liberated, right? So we're in the post-war. Meanwhile, uh, the two superpowers, I don't know, can you see the Rocky, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. can you see the Rocky and Drago? I don't know if you guys remember Rocky and Drago, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, the two superpowers are having an ideological struggle in defining the new world, uh, the new world order, and quickly uh, move their attention to Korea. Given all the messiness previously described, it should come as no surprise that no broad coalition of nationalists to assume leadership emerges. Communist supporters led by Kim Il-sung, there are moderates, and there are exiled nationalists such as Syngman Rhee, are all in the mix. A group known as the Committee for the Preparation of Korean Independence is never given a chance to gain traction and work things out. So the, super the superpowers backed their own Korean nationalist leaders and divided the peninsula at the 38th parallel. The USSR backs Kim Il-sung in the north and the US backs Syngman Rhee in the south. As a result, many communists flee to the north, while scores of landlords, businessmen, and Christians flee to the south. The Soviets encouraged the establishment of people's committees to mobilize and serve as the building blocks for political reconstruction. Uh, in the south, the US government supports former collaborator businessmen 
and landlords in the formation of the, South, of the Korean Democratic Party. Uh, and martial law is declared and the uh, people's committees are disbanded. The North, of course, is supported uh, by the USSR and the newly established uh, People's Republic of China. The North then invades the South to unify the peninsula and liberate the people of the South from the new colonizers and uh, old collaborators. As you know, the world now enters into the first hot war of the Cold War. War atrocities committed by both sides, uh, but no acknowledgement of culpability by either party. Eventually, an armistice is signed, dividing Korea in 1953. Although, of course, Korea is still officially at war, the two sides. Um, North Korea has always viewed the South Korean government as illegitimate, uh, former collaborators with the Japanese colonizers, and now pawns of the United States. Kim Il-sung considered, uh, is considered a real liberator and true patriot. He fought against the Japanese when it mattered. North Korea was ravaged by a U.S. bombing, destroying infrastructure. Despite the destruction, North Korea manages to rebuild its industrial base with lots of aid from the Soviet Union. Uh, and Kim Il-sung develops uh, an ideology around ideas of what, are, what is uh, known as self-reliance. It's called chuche in uh, Korean. And of course, we see this uh, cult of the leader develop that is fundamental in nation building and North Korean identity formation. This discourse is Confucian underpinnings and appropriates traditional systems of Korean rule, going back to the Joseon dynasty where we started. For example, a rigid hierarchy with no opportunities for social mobility gets established. We have a core class, a wavering class, and a hostile class. And this is all very ironic given the fact that we're talking about an ideal socialist and classless state. Uh, South Korea maintains very close political and military ties with the United States. They signed a mutual security agreement in 1954, and in 1958, this may be something you're not aware of, um, the U.S. introduced nuclear weapons into South Korea, which remained in the peninsula in South Korea until 1991. Economic aid, a key in keeping South Korean uh, economy was afloat, uh, to keeping the South uh, economy afloat um, early on, happens, and what probably surprises everyone, or might surprise you, is that, the South, Korea, that South Korea was behind North Korea uh, industrially and economically as late as the early 1970s. Um, and what they have politically is they inherit a series of dictators who put self-interest ahead of, of the people, and those dictators ruled uh, up until the 1980s. And it was the 1980s when the Korean people got out on the streets and fought hard, and finally Got, their, uh, got the government, uh, you know, for them. Uh, you know, going to 1999, we get to the collapse of the Soviet Union. This is a major, major event uh, with regards to uh, North Korea. Because what happens? The North Korean economy tanks. Uh, but even before the collapse, there were conditions contributing to an economic downturn as the Soviets began to uh, demand payment for oil and other exports. So by 1990s, North Korea is on the brink. Uh, in 1994, Kim Il-sung dies, and he's replaced by his son, uh, by his son Kim Jong-il. And as many as one million to two million people uh, die during the famine. Uh, the worst is over since 2000, but North Korea remains dependent on fo uh, foreign food aid. Uh, the question is, um, how would the ideology of self-reliance that we just talked about either help or impede relief efforts uh, from the international community? That's something to think about. In 1993, North Korea refuses to allow inspectors uh, by the International Atomic Energy Association officials. Planned talks with North Korea and, and the international community canceled are uh, canceled after Kim Il-sung's death. Uh, we see tests, uh, plutonium tests uh, and bomb, uh, plutonium, uh, excuse me, bomb tests in 2006. And North Korea continued to develop nuclear weapons capable, uh, capability under Kim Jong-il, who dies in 2011. 
The program is greatly expanded by the new leader of the DPRK, uh, Kim Jong-un, right? Who we are all familiar with, the son. And my last question is, can you see the dynasty, right? Can you see these continuities, continuities at play, right? From these very early, you know, um, very well entrenched ways of understanding the world. Um, they still play out today. So just going back to this uh, last uh, song, the song that we introduced, maybe it might make a little more uh, sense to us all, right? Our Father, we have nothing to envy in this world. Our house is in the embrace of the Workers' Party. We are all brothers and sisters. Even if a sea of fire comes toward us, sweet children, do not be afraid. Our Father is here. We have nothing to envy in this world. Okay. Um, that's uh, my presentation. But uh, what I'd like to do now is just introduce my colleague, uh, John Letman, who has uh, written numerous articles and he has a real, um, you know, thoughtful and insightful um, take on all of this stuff, and he's an expert on um, Asia-Pacific uh, geopolitical relations. Really. Hi, good evening. Um, we're going to get uh, my presentation in here, hopefully. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Lepman. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, my name is John Lepman. I know some of you, and it's nice to see such a good turnout. I really appreciate you coming out. I know it's the holidays. Everybody's getting busy. So I want to thank all of you. Can you hear me? All right. How's that? Better? Okay. I want to thank all of you for coming out. I appreciate you coming tonight. It's great to see so many people here. I also want to thank the KCC Student Activities Council uh, for taking part in preparing the wonderful food we're going to enjoy after this. I want to take, uh, thank the KCC History and Philosophy uh, for the wonderful presentation, introduction, and for being part of this. And I want to thank Raymond and everybody at the Kauai Alliance for Peace and Social Justice for all the important work you do and for encouraging Professor Umbrello and I to come together and to do this. So I have a lot of ground to cover and I'm going to move fairly fast. <clears throat> um, we're going to get right into it. My portion of the talk is called A Militarized State of Affairs. It's based on a reporting trip I did to Korea in late May. When we talk about South Korea, when we talk about North Korea, I think it's really important that we talk about Korea in the broader context, the Asia Pacific region, uh, West, uh, the West, Western Pacific. And all these places we see listed here have a large military, US military presence. So I wanna just really quickly run through what we have here. Starting here at home in Hawaii, we have the headquarters, the Pacific Command. We have the uh, U.S. Pacific Fleet, of course, here on the island of Kauai, we have the Pacific Missile Range, or PMRF, right here on the west side of the island. In the U.S. Territory of Guam, we have Anderson Air Force Base, Naval Base Guam, the headquarters of Joint Region Marianas. You've got two very large training areas called the MIT and the Merck. This is where uh, military testing and training takes place throughout the year. Of course, our two big allies in the east of Asia, we have Japan and South Korea. In Japan, you've got major naval and air force bases, over 55,000 troops permanently stationed. Okinawa bears the brunt of this with about 70% of all the bases, about 28,000 US Marines in tiny Okinawa, which is less than 1% of the Japanese territory. And then there were the US is forcing a new base to be built in a place called Hanoko, despite the protests that are ongoing and just making the news and all the other things happening there. In the Republic of Korea, which means South Korea, you've got major army bases like U.S. Army Garrison Humphreys, uh, Air Force, uh, you've got Osan Air Force Base, and you've got 28,500 troops, more or less permanently stationed. The Marshall Islands, in my opinion, it's left out of the mix, very important part of the equation. In the Marshall Islands, a lot of you are familiar with Kwajalein Atoll, you've at least heard of it. You know that with the Reagan test site, the anti-ballistic missile, testing facility is there. So Vandenberg Air Force Base in California and PMRF here on Kauai are firing ICBMs at Kwajalein Atoll training. Um, and then around Micronesia and, and around the Marshall Islands, we've got what we call um, the right of strategic denial, which is the US saying 
that we have exclusive military control over the land, the water, and the air for half a million square miles. In the Philippines, we were kicked out in 1992, asked to leave Subic Bay and Clark Air Force Base, huge bases in the Philippines were closed and the U.S. left more or less, but we're back. Uh, you don't hear it much in the news, but we're operating, the military is operating in the Philippines today under what's called EDCA, or the Enhanced Defense Cooperative Agreement. It's an executive agreement, so Congress never okayed this, and they, I don't know if they've ever even discussed it or let alone heard of it. Um, we've got the Marines rotating in and out of Australia. We've got a big spy base called Pine Gap in Australia. You've got military training and te testing all over the Asia Pacific, or what's now called the Indo-Asia Pacific. The more expansive term goes all the way to the Bay of Bengal, out to Hawaii, and so forth. So altogether, you've got about 90,000 troops. Think about that when you think about other wars going on. 90,000 U.S. troops in Japan, uh, South Korea, and then 6,300 on Guam. Uh, regional comparisons can be useful at times. If you compare what's happening with the chaos and the wars in the Middle East versus East Asia, if you add up all these places, and it's difficult to get the numbers, different places report different numbers, or they don't report anything, you've got between 15 and 16,500 troops, U.S. troops, of course, in Afghanistan, this uh, number in Iraq, Somalia, Syria, plus we have U.S. troops in Bahrain, Djibouti, Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, and so on. Altogether, that comes to about 78,000 troops. Versus in East Asia, in just two countries, in Japan and South Korea, and then we'll throw in Guam, the U.S. territory, we have 90,000. So it shows the importance of East Asia to the U.S. military, that we have 90,000 troops not fighting wars here, but they're here more or less permanently. Let's go. Um, again, 28,500 U.S. troops, about 80 U.S. bases or installations. U.S. military is in the process of consolidating. They don't want to have so many troops or so many um, bases. They want to have fewer number of bases, but they're expanding the ones that they have. So, for example, just below Seoul, you see where it says Pyeongtaek U.S. Army Garrison, USAG Humphreys formerly known as Camp Humphreys. That's where uh, Donald Trump went in November and visited the troops. So U.S. Army Garrison Humphreys is now the largest overseas U.S. base in the world. Eventually it'll have, uh, I think, about 45,000 people living there. It's big. I went there in May. It's very large. You've got Kunsan Air Base. You've got bases in Daegu, Osan, Rodriguez Complex Range up at the DMZ, and so forth. And then in the middle, down in the south, you see where it says Thad Battery. That's the uh, THAAD system we'll talk about in a few minutes. I think geographic comparisons are also useful if we compare North and South Korea to U.S. states. These are the sizes that uh, they occupy. South Korea is slightly larger than the state of Indiana. Indiana, not a terribly huge state, is it? So that's about the size of South Korea. North Korea is slightly smaller than the state of Mississippi. So if you think of Indiana and Mississippi, not huge states, but that's about the size of North and South Korea. Okay, next. Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or DPRK, known as North Korea, has a population currently of about 25 million people. The Republic of Korea, or ROK, or ROC, is South Korea, and that has about 51 million people, so double the population. Um, the places you see indicated on South Korea, those are the places I went report from. DMZ is the demilitarized zone, which is heavily militarized. The JSA is the joint area you see in the news all the time with the blue buildings in North Korea and South Korea, where the defector just ran across from the north the other day and was shot. Seoul, 35 miles to the south. Pyeongtaek, which is where Humphreys and Osan bases are. Songju County in the south is where the THAAD uh, anti-missile battery has been deployed. And then Jeju Island, um, we'll talk about that. That is in the south, too. Um, again, here's another map showing Seoul. You can see how very close it is to the DMZ. Um, it's, it, I drove up there in a bus. It took about 35, 40 minutes at most. It's extremely close. So as you probably read in the paper, 
even without nuclear weapons. The artillery that is positioned on the other side of the DMZ and the fighting that would take place if there was any kind of a war would be devastating. The reports are shocking. Take it from Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, who said a war with North Korea would be like a war none of us has seen in a lifetime. And for someone like Lindsey Graham, the senator from is it North Carolina, to say, oh, we would not be affected even over there is irresponsible as can be imagined. Of course we would be affected. All of us would be affected. We don't need a bomb to land on Kauai for us to be deeply affected immediately. So if you have spent time in, in Korea, or you're from Korea, South Korea that is, or you've lived there, you've served there in the military, you Korea and you spend time with the military, you hear the night tonight constantly. That is how they live. The, the idea that they're prepared and they're ready, if they need to, they will fight tonight. Or from the U.S. military side, we, I think we look at that as, oh, we're ready. If we have to, we're going to fight tonight. We are ready. We're training constantly for a fight, even if it's tonight. But then you think about how they hear it in North Korea, or how you would hear it if you were North Korean, and you had this massive country mobilized and constantly practicing and training for war and flying F-15s and B-1 bombers territory, ready to fight tonight, how would you take it? The, the slogan that they live by is not tonight. And then you've got our U.S. Republic of Korea, that's South Korea, war games constantly going on, 40 years of war games. You know, we talk about annual war games. Well, that makes it sound like it happens once a year, when in fact, this is going on all year long. It's a game or ends, there's two, and then so there's, it's annual game, but a series of them. So it's constantly going on. Um, these war games include amphibious landings, surgical strikes, and recently decapitation exercises, which is exactly what it sounds like. They're ready to head off the leadership of the North. Full Eagle took place a few months ago, I think in the spring. <clears throat> it included ground, air, naval, and special ops. SEAL Team 6, I think, was deployed for the first time largest exercise that we've undertaken there. In August, when we had this extreme tension with Guam and threats of fire and fury and so forth, uh, a, a drill called Ulchi Freedom, which was a computer simulated drill, included 17,500 US troops, 50,000 South Korean troops, that took place. Now one possible off-ramp to this, this march or this hurl towards war is this idea of freeze for freeze. You may have heard in the news, it's all idea that the North Koreans will freeze their nuclear testing activities, their ballistic missiles, and we will freeze or significantly scale back our war games, which the U.S. dismisses out of hand every time, and so we never get any closer. But that's something that's often discussed, this idea of freeze for freeze. And then, of course, the United States maintains what's called a continuous bomber presence, largely out of Guam. Um, where we're conducting these flyovers of the Korean Peninsula using nuclear-capable aircraft like B-2 and B-52 bombers, F-15s, F-22s, F-35s, and all this does... Well, I talked to um, Scott Snyder, who's in Washington, D.C., at a think tank, and he said these, by repeating these, these flyovers, the nuclear flyovers, it's of, he called it diminishing utility. It's becoming less and less effective every time we do it. Oh, we're doing it again. Well, it also ensures a state of heightened tension and reinforces North Korean insecurities and keeps them in an, a, a constant attack mode posture. Just last weekend, this past weekend, on Sunday, December 2nd, we started a new a war game called, it's an annual joint air drill called Vigilant Ace, which we sent six F-22 Raptors to South Korea uh, to, as a show of force, and this is going on through the 8th of December tomorrow there now. So it's wrapping up today, basically. But it includes all these aircraft, B-1 bombers, F-35s, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a veritable alphabet soup. 230 US and South Korean aircraft conducting simulated attacks on North Korean military targets. So if you're in North Korea, when you're about 
a march to war and North Korea accuses us and we accuse them, well, sure, it takes two to tangle, and we're tangoing. So I want to step back to North Korea and step back to Kauai for just a moment and talk a little bit about the role that we all play as residents who work here and live in Kauai that we play in the of us are familiar with it, um, but I'll just go over some of these things you may already know. I apologize if you know it already. Uh, THAAD, T-H-A-A-D, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System. It's an anti-ballistic missile system. It um, was tested and trained here at PMRF, and it is, was deployed in 2013 in Guam. Um, it was announced last year that it would be deployed in South Korea. And as soon as Pak Geun Hye, the now deposed leader, uh, said that it was going to be deployed, the protest started, and they have not stopped since. But they did deploy it under force in Songju in remote South Korea. And next, it's going to Saudi Arabia. That's where it's going to be deployed next. Um, Aegis Ashore is another system. It's the, it's the land-based version of the Aegis destroyer ballistic missile defense system. Also tested, we've got the, all the equipment out there at PMRF just past Kekaha. And that was deployed at a naval station in Romania in 2016. It will next be deployed in Poland in 2018. Tested here, deployed in Romania and Poland. The Russians don't like it. We say it's not aimed at them, it's aimed at Iran. Japan is probably next. The Japanese defense minister is coming to Hawaii to talk to um, Commander uh, Pacific Command Harry Harris, and he's going to talk to Jim Mattis, the Defense Secretary in Hawaii, and then he'll come to Kauai and see the Aegis system here. Something else called the Advanced Hypersonic Weapon has been tested here. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then RIMPAC, the Rim of the Pacific biennial exercises that take place every other year. The next one will be 2018, I believe. These include the Osprey we know from Okinawa and Hawaii too, the ones that have a crashing problem. Um, amphibious assault vehicles coming up on beaches here. Um, helicopter raid training, which takes place at PMRF. You can go on find of the PMRF training for war and other launches. You know, I was at a, an event um, at the Marriott a couple years ago, and Senator Daniel Inouye's wife, um, um, Irene, the keynote speaker, and there were all these people from Lockheed Martin and Atomic General and so forth. And they were singing the praises of the defense industry here on Kauai, the big role we play. And uh, Irene Hirano said, yeah, you know, everybody in defense circles knows about Kauai. Everybody knows about PMRF. And so we're big in Israel. <laughs> Sandia National Laboratories is a nuclear weapons laboratory. They operate Kauai Test Facility, which is a tenant inside PMRF. When I first saw the sign, when I was visiting PMRF in 2014, and I saw the Sandia logo, I was very surprised. So, Kauai Test Facility operates, uh, it was established in 1963 um, in support of high altitude nuclear weapons testing over the Pacific and has launched over 440 launches since that time. In 2011, they tested what's called the Advanced Hypersonic Weapon. Um, it's supposed to travel between three and 6,000 kilometers in half an hour. The whole idea is that you can strike a high profile or high value target anywhere in an hour. So that testing takes place here, or has taken place here. And if you're not familiar with what Sandia is or who they are or what they do, you should go online and look it up. But there's part of their mission is we support US deterrence policy by helping sustain, modernize, and secure the nuclear arsenal through our primary nuclear weapons mission. And that mission is to nuke I seem, think they say to nuclearize the, um, or to, to weaponize the nuclear package. So that's happening here on Kauai. So we definitely have a role. Next one. We greet the world with open arms. As I said, the Japanese defense minister will be here next month to look at the Aegis Ashore system and further militarized East Asia. Politicians and commanders, I'm thinking of Admiral Harry Harris, who's the head of Pacific Command, and I'm thinking of uh, Representative Tulsi Gabbard, who last May was kind of talking along the lines of Harry Harris, not saying to operationalize PMRF, but saying that we need to consider it, we need to look at it more closely. Um, I don't know what, if, if she's backed away from that position now. It seems like she may have. It seems like everybody's kind of stepped back a little bit. 
When I asked PMRF about this, they said, we're only a testing and training facility. We're not going to become ready, combat ready. Um, but there are people who are talking about maybe it's time to do that. And there are proponents and there are opponents of this idea. But at least know that it is in the works as far as discussing or considering. Um, Colleen Hanabusa, uh, District 1, in a written statement recently said to me that she said there is no need to do that. So there may be a difference between her and Tulsi Gabbard there. Next slide. Um, this is the uh, CEO of Lockheed Martin, the world's largest defense contractor. Her name is um, Marilyn Hewson. She t was talking about THAAD, the THAAD system, um, to investors on a phone call in 2015. She was recorded and she said, quote, a lot of volatility, a lot of instability, a lot of things happening in the Middle East and the Asia Pacific region means both are growth areas for Lockheed Martin. So it's this tension in East Asia is a growth area for Lockheed Martin. Lockheed, who manufactures THAAD, describes it in their own words. They have a product card on their website, just like you'd have a product for anything else. They describe it as designed to defend US troops, allied forces, population centers, critical infrastructure, and so forth. So the first thing they say they're defending is US troops. Well, that makes sense if you're in the business of defending US troops, but that's not lost on the South Koreans. And so when we introduce that system there, the South Koreans say, this isn't even to protect us, this is to protect your own troops. And the argument has been made, well, the, our troops protect you. Next slide. So this is a photo I took in so Sosong-ri village, which is in Songju County in South Korea. And these are the protesters, and they protest every single day. If you want to learn how to protest, go to South Korea. They know how to do it. Um, they don't just get out there and yell and scream. They make the protests fun and engaging, and it's a family-friendly event, because when you're protesting every day for years on end, it can't always be dark and gloomy. You've got to have an uplifting feeling, too. You want to build community. But these are the people that are protesting. So they're spending their golden years. They're in their 80s and 90s. These are very conservative farmers in rural South Korea who are out there railing and fighting against South Korean police and the US military because they don't want this system introduced into their small rural community. They have Chinook helicopters. When I was talking to these folks and I thought, why do these elderly Korean women know Chinook? You know, because they're flying over their house every day and they're shaking the windows, they're shaking the roofs, and they're shaking their core, you know. This is something that brings back a lot of bad memories from these folks. This gentleman has a sign that says, absolutely no THAAD deployment. THAAD has been deployed. It is now operational in South Korea, but the protests did not stop. They continue. Okay. Um, and we, we talk about, well, the, the need to have the US troops there to protect South Korea, to you know, support the alliance and so forth. But keep in mind, South Korea has a very substantial military themselves. CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute in 2016, ranks South Korea as the 10th largest military spender after the UK, Japan, and Germany. So if you look at the top 10 military spenders in the world, it's all the US and our allies except for China and Russia the second and third positions. But everybody else is more or less an ally. So South Korea is a big weapons importer, weapons exporter. So they're spending a lot on their own military without us. This is a, a shot I took from a rooftop looking over into US Army Garrison Humphreys or Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek, South Korea, the site of the largest overseas military base in the world. It is very, very big. Years when they were expanding it, they had to village, and the people had to be moved out. There were fierce protests in 2005, 2006. Do you remember that? I don't. Okay. Next. This is an, over, this is an army slide. It's an overlay of uh, Humphreys over Washington D.C. 3,400 acres. It's tripled in size. Um, and it shows you how big it is compared with Washington, D.C., extending from Key Bridge to the U.S. Capitol to National Park over to Arlington Cemetery. It's pretty big. Okay. Um, just really quickly talk about a myth that's been perpetuated by you-know-who, this idea that the Allies, in particular South Korea, aren't paying their fair share, that they're free-riding. It's simply not true. 
As early as 2011, Donald Trump was saying the South, the Koreans aren't paying, they're not paying, this whole idea that the U.S. is a victim. In 2016, as a candidate, he continued to falsely and repeatedly suggest the US, that South Korea doesn't pay enough. The same year in 2016, the man on the left and saluting General Vincent Brooks, now the head of U.S. Forces Korea, said, well, it's cheaper for us to keep U.S. forces in South Korea than it is in the U.S., and so there they stay. Um, Keep in mind, under a special measures agreement that happens every five years, it's renewed. It's an agreement between the U.S. and South Korea. They pay, right now it's over 800, it's like $850 million a year for the U.S. presence. The South Korean taxpayers are paying, it's called burden sharing. Um, and also keep in mind, and uh, he should know this, um, the $11 billion, it's more like $10.7 billion expense Camp Humphreys, 90% or more of that was paid by the South Korean taxpayers. Um, th to his credit, there was a wonderful South Korean reporter when Trump was there last month who challenged him. It was great. He challenged him and he said, you know, what you say that we're free riding. And Trump, he fudged, of course. He said, oh, I know this is an expensive bait. He paid some of that money. He did pay some so keep in mind, the Koreans are paying a lot of money for this. Not everybody's vocal about it. Not everybody cares, but a lot of people do care. You can ask yourself, how would you feel? Okay, next. Korean uh, citizens are concerned about, among other things, the things you hear in other bases, in places like Okinawa and so forth. Noise, crime, danger, pollution, the high cost, questions of sovereignty, something that can, people can relate to here for sure. Land seizures, land being taken away to expand the military base. And then the whole idea of militarizing further just cr increases the likelihood or the threat of war. Camp towns, you may have heard of these, outside bases. In South Korea, it's a problem. In Okinawa, it's too. Outside the bases, when you have clusters of bars and restaurants and other bit clubs and things that, that do U.S. military personnel, um, where the troops go out and they have a good time, but this sometimes leads to bar fights, to crime, um, attacks on taxi drivers and other people, violence, fighting, prostitution is a big problem, and that prostitution is fed by human trafficking, a lot of it from the Philippines, um, coming up to uh, South Korea. So these are other issues that, that I heard people talking about when I was there. I want to just really quickly talk about Jeju Island. You can see how strategically uh, located it is. This is a place where a, a Korean naval base was built and made operational as of last uh, year, uh, February 2016. When they were building it, and the resistance went on for 10 years, and it's today, even though it's been built, they were worried that this was not going to be a Korean base, this is going to be an American base. They said no, and the Americans said no, and they said this is for our own defense, this is us defending ourselves. And people, opponents, they said no, 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 you're going to um, U.S. naval uh, craft come, and sure enough, since uh, March this year, there have been nine visits of them from the U.S. of destroyers and so forth. Um, the base itself is in the south part of the island. The island is about the size of Maui, although it's shaped differently. Um, it's a beautiful place. It was designated an island of peace in recognition of a terrible historical event that I'll talk about in the next slide. I won't talk about this at length because it's really complicated, but it's something to know exists. It's called the April 3rd incident, it, it, which suggests that it took place in one day, which is not the case. It took place over seven years, between 1947 and 1954, um, when you had the U.S. military running the show in the South um, allied with the Korean forces. The Korean forces brutally um, executed this, um, this uh, scorched earth policy, were severe were killed, uh, villages were razed, houses were destroyed, and people disappeared, some 30,000, about 10% of the population. Uh, that The term complicit has been used a lot this year. Well, the term complicit is being used here um, by South Koreans who say the U.S. has been complicit. Well, the U.S., to my knowledge, has never really talked about this and, and doesn't really claim any responsibility, but the fingers being pointed by South Korea at the United States who say that they were not only aware, but in some instances played an active role in facilitating the violence. So if you want to know more about this, look it up online, but 
It's, uh, it's something to be uh, aware of that took place in Jeju Island, and it informs the current attitudes against the military on that island. This is a, a protest outside the base. This is, again, this is a Korean naval base. They call it the multi-purpose naval port complex. They say it's part civilian, it's, it's part military. The military part was built first. They're now building the civilian part. But the base protests continue six days a week. They know how to protest. Next. Again, back to the question of, is this just a Korean base? This is a shot, and if any of you have been to Jeju Island and you see this photo, um, people who haven't seen this but have been there would probably cry to see this because it was a very beautiful place. Um, there's a very important place. It was not a hail, but it was significant to them like a hail that was covered in concrete so that the base could be built. Um, and again, like I said before, uh, the U.S. aircraft, the, the nuclear uh, destroyers or nuclear submarines and, and destroyers are starting to come more frequently, as was laid out in a Navy report in 2013. So when we talk about all this, these issues with the U.S. military and with, with the militarization of South Korea, in the news, when you watch and read the news in, here in America, the question to me anyway comes to mind is where are the Korean voices? We hear about the experts, we hear about the politicians, we hear about the heads of state, but what about the ordinary Korean people like the folks you see here in the photo? It'd be great to see for, more foreign media coverage you know, with Korean voices, Korean people offering Korean solutions. The South Koreans seem to be left out of this whole equation. Sometimes you're like, where are they? Well, if they're not being covered, you're not gonna know what's on their mind. They have a lot of ideas that obviously they're at the center of this, they should be considered. South Korea NGOs, civil and civic right groups are very energetic, they're very mobilized, and they're very good at building coalitions. Like I said, if you wanna learn how to protest, go to South Korea, they know how to do it. Remember what happened to Park Geun-hye, previous president, she's now behind bars. They did that all with street protests. They waged years long campaigns against Militarization in Pyeongtaek, in Jeju, in Songju, and those protests continue. A few quick questions and comments of things I heard from people when I was in South Korea in May. Simple questions, and I'll go through this fast. Why was Korea divided? Why are there so many U.S. troops here after so many years? Why is there a double standard on weapons testing for the U.S. and North Korea when they're testing WMD, when they're testing ICBMs, we hear all about it, but when the U.S. does it, we hear nothing. Yeah. It's unreasonable and it's proven ineffective to demand North Korea denuclearize before we negotiate. Again, these are things people said to me. Um, one woman said to me, a couple people said to me, we're starting to have anti-American sentiments. These are South Korean folks, our allies. They said, we don't hate Americans, but we're starting to feel bad. One woman said to me, Yankee, go home, not directed to me, but she was, that was her way to it. She didn't speak English, but that's how she expressed her sentiment. Um, someone else asked, would Americans be willing to fight a war inside their own country? Would we be willing to fight a war in Montana or in North Dakota or in Texas or California or on Maui or in Kauai? And yet we seem willing to, be, to fight a war over there if we have to. Um, people said we need more solidarity between places that are militarized like Guam, Okinawa, Hawaii, and other parts of the Pacific and the world. Someone said to me, many Americans mistakenly think Koreans want U.S. bases on our land. We don't. Some people do, but a lot of people don't. Someone else pointed out that the divided Korean peninsula is a great way to sell more weapons. We see that all the time. And then the first interview I did, the day I arrived, a woman said to me, why should the U.S. stay here forever? You should go back to your own country. So. The thing to take away from all this is that Koreans absolutely do not war. As Professor Umbrella was saying earlier, there's a very strong connection between North and, North and South Korea, despite the political divisions and all the other hateful rhetoric. People have relatives. Between one, one out of six and one out of seven Koreans are said to have family on the other side of the border. They speak the same language, they eat the same food. They don't want to fight with their cousins, their aunties, their uncles, their long lost brother or sister. Overwhelmingly, Koreans are not in favor of war, period. Next slide. So what can we do here on Kauai? Well, think, watch, and talk. Consider the events in their historical and global context. 
Ask yourself how you would feel if you were in their position. We can pay close attention to the events in the region because the situation is changing daily. There are lots of different types of media we can follow beside the usual media that you might be following. Different NGOs, activist groups, the military has a lot of media that's worth watching closely too. The government, there are many different forms of media that we can keep an eye on this subject. And then raise the subject, raise the question of militarism in Korea and elsewhere with your friends or your family. It's something that we never seem to really talk about with other people, and yet I think we should. And then question your elected officials, members of Congress especially. Uh, don't be afraid to challenge them. If you're not getting the answer you think you deserve or if you, or if you have a different point of view, don't be afraid to challenge them. It's something that happens far too little. Next. Um, if you want to know more about the Jeju incident, the, four, the April 3rd incident, you can watch this film. You can I think you see it on YouTube. It's called The Ghosts of Jeju. As you can see by the image, it is an extremely disturbing and very dark film, but it's important to understand. It's that, that the incident, the April 3rd incident, was the template for what we see happening in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in so many other places. It's almost like they wrote the textbook in Jeju. Um, you can watch that film. Read Bruce Cummings' book, The Korean War. It's not a very long book. You can find it at the library. You can find it at Amazon or wherever. But once you read that book, you will have absolutely no doubt, or there will be no question in your mind why North Korea feels the way they do about the U.S. It's, uh, it's pretty shocking stuff. And then despite you know who, you can use Twitter. It's a great way to find out what's happening by following ordinary Korean people, peace activists, Korea experts, journalists who cover Korea and the Asia Pacific region, politicians, think tanks who study these issues, foreign media. There's a lot of really good English uh, media coming out of Korea. And then military social media also has a lot of really important things that you probably wouldn't hear about unless you saw it on their Facebook or Twitter accounts. Uh, if you're interested, these are some links. They're on the papers that have been passed around to some, some of the stories I wrote based on my reporting trip of South Korea that go a little bit more in depth in what we're talking about here. So check them out if you're interested. And that's it. I want to thank all of you for coming out. And thanks to uh, Professor Umbrella, too, for that excellent uh, historical introduction. I think what do now is a little very quick Q&A. Yeah. But it's, we're gonna, I thought what we do is we're going to have a, a quick Q&A really quick, if anybody has a really pressing question or needs to go or something. And then we're going to keep wrap it up pretty quickly so that we can enjoy some food, which was very generously prepared for us. And we can stay and talk and enjoy food together and we'll be around. So does anybody have a question they want to start with? Do you want to come up? Sure. Um, sure. Why don't you go ahead, sir? With the amount of arms we have over there, with the North... The yeah, I'm, I'm repeating the question. With the amount of arms that the U.S. has over there in, on the Korean Peninsula, wouldn't they be insane to do anything and risk being wiped off the map, was your question, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah I think so. I mean, I think that's kind of the general consensus. A lot of people have said that, and yeah, I think that's what people are saying, that why war may not happen, and yet... You know, there's, it's an it's a extremely dangerous, it's not a game, but it's an extremely way to, to deal with disputes with nuclear weapons and people like uh, those who are in control of them. So yeah, I think it would be crazy. I think it's crazy what we're doing now, though. You know, people say, oh, the U.S. isn't going to use its nuclear weapons. We're using them right now. We use them every single day. When you point a gun at somebody, you're using that gun, whether you fire the trigger or not. Same with the nuclear weapons. Yes, sir. Uh, following on that, uh, realistically, could uh, nuclear weapons be dropped on North Korea? That's pretty close to China and Japan. Realist your question was realistically, could, yes. could weapons be dropped on North Korea with. With, is there concern of radiation from with Japan and Korea, or Japan and, and Russia and China so close? Could they be used? 
they absolutely could be used. I mean, yeah, I think they, they could be used. It's, will they? I don't know. But yeah, I mean, this is all very real. They're ready to go. I mean, they're talking about, they're saying, shouldn't we start moving dependents? Shouldn't we start moving families of U.S. soldiers off the Korean Peninsula? That's pretty serious talk, even though they're saying they're not going to do it right now. Could they be used? Yeah, they could be. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what to say about that, but I, I think it's, I take it seriously. I think most people do. It, it, it could definitely happen. Miscalculation and so forth. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know about that. You want to add anything? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I'd like to jump in. Um, I think something that we all need to sort of um, contemplate or take into account is the fact that uh, the present administration has, ref has, has still yet to put an ambassador in the uh, South Korean embassy, and we see the continual sort of stripping down of the State Department, which is uh, incredibly alarming because it is through those channels that uh, you know, peace is, is, is able to be maintained and brokered. So, uh, one man uh, with very little uh, diplomatic uh, and uh, knowledge of sort of the world around him um, I think is very troubling uh, to be able to just uh, pop off and, and make um, remarks that uh, endanger you know so many people around the world and I would like to see uh, more pressure uh, and more uh, support of our uh, diplomatic corps to, to help sort of understand these, these issues and, and, and create the dialogues that are necessary to, to maintain peace. Yeah. Can I take a couple more? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. How about you, sir? Do you think that nuclear tension is comparable to, the cold, to that of the Cold War? Uh, as a historian, I don't think we've ever ended. The Cold War hasn't ended. Uh, so it's just a continuation of it, and um, I think we're at a point um, as perhaps um, dangerous and um, unprecedented um, with perhaps some corollaries to maybe the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. So I think, yeah, I think it's super real right now. I want the lady in the back with the glasses. Yeah, let me, let me, thank you for that. Let me just quickly summarize. She, she was talking about Daniel Ellsberg, the famous whistleblower, the Pentagon Papers, who's just come out with a book about his time as a nuclear war planner. So you can find that. There were recent interviews on NPR and Democracy Now. Maybe we take one more? Okay, last question. And then, and then of course, uh, we can continue conversations yeah. as we enjoy the food yeah. uh, and have some fun. This is the last question without food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ma'am, did you have a question? You, do you want to? Oh. How do we support the diplomatic corps? Uh, you know, How do we support the diplomatic uh, we corps? We need to support the diplomatic corps uh, in the U.S. Sure. When they're being laid off. 
Right. I mean, how do we even know about it? <laughs> well, I think, you know, first place to start is just to raise awareness, right? And then get together, network with people, uh, and then, you know, build, a co build, coalition, build coalitions and, uh, you know, keep moving up the, up the food chain to uh, be able to get, you know, uh, your, your voices heard to, um, to people who can, you know, um, ultimately get to where change needs to happen, and it's got to happen at the ballot box, ultimately. Yeah. But write yeah, your you write your congressman, exactly. And, and, then, and then real quickly, end note, on, on, that, on that same note, um, yeah, am, what, what uh, Professor Umbrella said, but also to amplify your voices, let your, we've got four members of Congress in Hawaii, they're on the same page on this issue, and so let them know. You call them, you email them, you tell them, this is an important issue to me. This is a problem that needs to be, it's part of a bigger problem that needs to be resolved. They keep track, so let them know. Their voice is louder than our voices are, um, at least in, in, in one sense. So, um, should we enjoy some food and Let's then we'll continue that. the lively discussion? <laughs> uh, it's really great to see all of you here. Thank you very much, and we've got wonderful food right here. And we're going to continue to talk about these issues. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, stick around. Enjoy.